In these studies at the present time we're dealing with the theme that we have entitled Jesus the last Adam. Our theme is that Jesus came to earth as the representative of the Adamic race to become our kinsman redeemer, to take our nature and by taking our nature to redeem us. That he became a true descendant of Adam and that on the cross the entire evil inheritance due to the Adamic race came upon Jesus. The key verse, Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord made to meet together upon him the iniquity of us all, where the word iniquity denotes rebellion and all its evil consequences. And we have been seeing various aspects of this exchange that took place on the cross, where Jesus took the evil that was due to us, that we in return might receive the good that was his by eternal right. We have so far seen seven aspects of this exchange which I will mention briefly and then move on into an eighth aspect that I want to deal with in this study. First of all, Jesus was punished for our sins that we might have peace, reconciliation and forgiveness. He was wounded physically with our sicknesses and our pains that we might be healed physically. God made his soul to be sin. He became the sin offering that we in return might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made him sick with our sickfulness that we might be made whole with his help. He was made a curse with the curse of the broken law that we might receive the blessing that is due to his obedience. He became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. And in the last study we entered rather fully into the statement that by the grace of God he tasted death for every man. For every individual of the human race, Jesus tasted death in all its phases. We traced three successive phases. Spiritually, when he became identified with our sin, he was cut off from fellowship and union with God. He forfeited the spiritual life that he had through union with the Father. Secondly, on the cross, he endured physical death. His spirit was separated from his body. His body was then laid aside in the tomb but saw no corruption. Thirdly, he endured banishment from God's presence into Hades or Sheol, descended in spirit into Hades and there endured the ultimate wrath of Almighty God in the spiritual realm upon all the wickedness and rebelliousness of the human race. And having endured that, he was made alive in the spirit, proclaimed the good news of deliverance to the righteous believers, and made a proclamation of his authority, as I believe, to the unrighteous believers, and was resurrected, raised up physically from the dead. And as a result of this, we can have life in three successive phases. Right now, we can have the union with God in the spirit that brings spiritual life. Paul says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. We can have physical life in a measure in the sense that we can have divine resurrection life working in our mortal bodies and in due course at the resurrection we will receive immortal incorruptible bodies and thirdly the climax of redemption we can have eternal fellowship with God and with one another in the presence of Almighty God. Now I would like to go on to an eighth aspect of this exchange which is found there in your outline. The reference given in your outline at the top of the sheet there is Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. We'll read that and this will bring out the aspect of exchange that we want to deal with. In Romans chapter 6 verse 6 the King James Version says this, knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that is with Christ that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. In a few moments I'll try to improve a little on that translation but let me point out that the exchange that we are now dealing with is between the old man and the new man. The old man died in Christ on the cross that by exchange the new man might live in us now. So bear this in mind, the exchange that we're dealing with is between the old man and the new man. This is a theme that runs through the New Testament but is very little dealt with in many sections of the church today the contrast and the relationship between the old man that died on the cross and the new man that is brought forth through the resurrection of Jesus. 
Let me um, now try to modify the translation in Romans 6 a little to make it just a little more clear and a little more literal. Romans 6, 6 Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. It's a simple past tense. It's not a perfect tense. In other words, it's a historical event that actually took place at a given moment in time. I think it tremendously strengthens our faith when we view it this way. It is something that actually did happen. It's true whether we believe it or not. It's true whether we know it or not. But when we know it and believe it, it's going to have a tremendous effect on our lives. Our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. Many modern translations will say annulled. I prefer to say rendered ineffective, put out of action. That henceforth we should not be slaves of sin. This is just a little clearer translation. The slavery of sin is terminated in our lives when we realize that the old man died and that now there is a new man living in us. But if we do not realize this, believe it, and act upon it, there is no full escape from the slavery of sin. This is the way out of the bondage or slavery of sin. And you will find that believers that do not know this and do not believe this never fully escape from the bondage of sin. As a matter of fact, my experiences with professing Christians of many different backgrounds, most Christians expect to go on sinning. And you know what happens? It happens unto them according to their faith. That's exactly what happens. For instance, let me say this, I was brought up in the Anglican Church in Britain. No matter what I did all through the week, I knew that by the rituals of my church, I was going to be there on Sunday morning confessing to God that I had erred and strayed from his ways like a lost sheep. I had done those things which I ought not to have done and left undone those things which I ought to have done and that there was no health in me. So no matter how I conducted myself through the week, I was bound to be there confessing that I'd committed sins at the end of the week. The result was, of course, that I had plenty of sins to confess. But this is not scriptural. The scripture does not say that at the end of every seven days we're going to have a certain number of sins we have to confess. The scripture says there is a way of escape from the slavery of sin. But if we don't know what the scripture says, and if we don't believe it, we shall not experience the escape. There is no other way of escape from the bondage of sin, but this, the divinely appointed way, which comes through knowledge of the scripture, and knowledge of what happened to Jesus on the cross, in this respect of the old man and the new man. Now, let's look at what the scripture says about the old man. This means the Adamic nature which every one of us has received by inheritance from Adam. And I think there are two words that probably best describe this nature. The one is rebellious and the other is corrupt. We are all by nature rebels. And we are all by nature spiritually and physically corrupt. This is a fact about every descendant of Adam. Now this phrase, the old man, uh, is one of various phrases that Paul uses in his writings and I'd like to give you some of the others which all refer basically to the same thing. Paul also uses the body, the body of sin, the body of the sins of the flesh, and the flesh. Now, in many passages in his writings where we read these words, we cannot understand the literal physical body. It would make no sense. He's not referring to the physical body, but he's referring to that nature that came into the world with us when we came in with our physical body. That's the connection. He now, he uses this alternate phrase here in Romans 6, 6. He says that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be rendered of no effect. That doesn't mean that we become physically paralyzed and unable to use our bodies. That's obvious. He's not referring to the physical body, but he's referring to that nature which is so closely associated with the physical body because the two came into the world simultaneously, one with the other. In Romans 8.10, he refers simply to the body. He says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Obviously, it doesn't mean that every time a person receives Christ, he dies physically. That would be ridiculous. It means this old nature is dead when Christ comes in. And then in Colossians 2.12, he uses the most elaborate of all phrases. Colossians 2.11. He says, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. There's, he gives us everything there. The body of the sins of the flesh. 
Sometimes he calls it the body, sometimes the body of sin, sometimes the body of the sins of the flesh, but it all refers to one and the same thing. Now the other phrase that he also uses in this special significance is the flesh. And if you want a context, uh, a passage for that, turn to Galatians 5, and you could read from verse 17 through verse 24. We don't need to read all the verses, but let's just notice what Paul says there, and they built in contrast and conflict between the flesh, the old Adamic nature, and the spirit, the nature that represents the will and mind of God. And we have to see there is a total, unchangeable opposition. It cannot be changed, and God doesn't even set out to change it. He says in verse 17 of Galatians 5, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. The desires of the flesh are in opposition to the desires of the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The desires of the spirit are opposite to those of the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. We have to see this. The spiritual nature of God is contrary to the old Adamic nature. Now then, in verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest. They're very obvious, which are these. Adultery, fornication, and so on. A very unpleasant list that we do not need to read in detail. Verse 22, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. The exact opposite. And then notice verse 24, which is a very interesting verse. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now this is a mark of belonging to Christ, and it's a very important mark. They that are Christ. It doesn't say Baptists or Episcopalians or Pentecostals. Because God doesn't deal with people by denominational labels. The mark of belonging to Christ is that we have crucified the flesh, the old Adamic, rebellious, corrupt nature. Now notice in Romans 6, 6 it says it was done by God. Our old man was crucified. But in Galatians 5, 24 the responsibility is placed on you and me. We have crucified the flesh. This is typical of all God's provisions. As far as God is concerned it was finished when Christ died. But as far as your and my experience is concerned we have to translate God's provision on the cross into practical experience in our own lives. And that's of course, where the problems arise. There's no problem in God's provision. The problem is in transferring God's provision into my personal experience. And here, a responsibility is placed upon me to crucify my flesh. Notice, please, not just with the lusts, but with the affections, the moods, the whims, the little silly sympathies that you feel that are not godly the fits of depression and self-pity that are not lusts but are just as deadly and just as much of the enemy. See, many Christians would say, oh, greed is a sin, adultery is a sin. But you see, being moody, being depressed, being fearful, they're just as much the works of the flesh as adultery and fornication. And we'll never really get the victory if we don't identify them. And there comes a time when you have got to put the nails of the cross through your moodiness, through your self-pity, through your desire to be admired and thought well of. Because when Jesus hung on the cross, no one admired him and no one thought well of him, believe me. It was the end of all pride and all religious righteousness. It was a total death. And here's where the nails still hurt a little. It's when we come to these areas of our lives and uh, there is a process. It's all done in Christ. Scripture says, By one offering hath he perfected forever. That's finished. Them that are being sanctified. There's a process of being sanctified that's being worked out in us on the basis of what he has done. He'll never have to do more. It's all provided. But we have to appropriate it. And that is a painful process. I remember, if I may interject a word of personal testimony, when I was newly saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit in the British Army, the British Army and the providence of God sent me to the wilderness, the North African desert, and I spent three years after conversion in deserts, and I tell you, I mean deserts, real, literal, sandy, howling wastes. There's something about a desert, I can read the experiences of the children of Israel in the desert with a real sympathy and understanding. I've lain in sand, ate sand, drank sand, washed in sand, and had it blown in my eyes and my ears until you couldn't see the color of my skin. 
and I've seen it hot at night and uh, hot in the day and bitterly cold at night. And I've lain there without any shelter but a blanket. Uh, this is just by way of personal experience. But while I was out there in the year 1941 or 42, uh, I hadn't learned then that murmuring was a sin. <clears throat> and I had three blankets, as a matter of fact, which every, four blankets, every British soldier was issued with four blankets. Now I had one blanket which I prized above all others, it was a horse blanket. It wasn't exactly particularly refined and delicate, but it was twice as big as any other blanket, and it still counted as one blanket. And I'll tell you, of all my possessions in the desert, apart from my Bible, my horse blanket was my most cherished. How I got it, I really don't recall. And I remember one night, I was lying there on my back on the sand, wrapped in these blankets, and thinking, God, why do you have to put me in this wilderness? I'm too good for a place like this. And as I lay on my back, stretched out, an extraordinary thing happened. My arms were stretched out, horizontal to my body, exactly in the picture of a person, posture of a person crucified. And somehow this blanket got so entwined around me that I could not move. And God said, there you are, you're on the cross. And I was. I was literally crucified in the at attitude. A few days later, I was wrapped in the same blankets again, in the same situation, this time I had my hands down by my side and the blankets were rolled around me and I couldn't get my arms free. And God said, you're buried too, rolled up in the blanket and buried. And so I learned these truths in a very vivid way. But I'll tell you, it's one thing to learn them intellectually. It's another thing to prove them experientially. It took me about three years to stop murmuring about the desert. And when I finished murmuring about the desert, you know what happened? I got out of the desert. And when I got out of the desert, I was sorry to leave, I'll tell you that. That's another story I can't go into, but I was really, I cried when I left the desert because I'd fallen in love with the people that lived there, but that's another story. But the more you murmur, I'll tell you this, the longer you'll stay in the desert. You know what the Bible says in Psalm 68? The rebellious shall dwell in a dry land. That's where the rebellious belong. Well, coming back to this, it has happened on the cross. Our old man was crucified. Now we work it out. We crucify our flesh. And just when you think, wonderful, I've finished with it, you know what happens? Another area is revealed by the Holy Spirit. You haven't dealt with that area yet. But praise God, it pays to go through with the Lord. It works out in the long run. Now let's look in Ephesians 2 for a moment and see what the scripture says about this old nature of ours. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2 verses 2 and 3. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Notice that Satan is able to work as a spirit in us so long as we are the children of disobedience. As long as there is any area of disobedience within us, that's the area upon which Satan is entitled to exert his influence. And no matter what you do, you can shout at him, you can cry to God, you can fast, but Satan has a legal right to, to exert his influence upon any area of rebellion and disobedience within us. The only way to prevent his influence is to cut off the rebellion and disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Notice the mind is just as much alienated from God as the flesh. Uh, Romans 8 says the carnal mind is enmity against God. And we're by nature the children of wrath. Now that word by nature is used in Galatians 2.15, if you want to turn there for a moment. Exactly the same phrase is used. Galatians 2.15, Paul is talking to Peter as two Jews and he says we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles that's the thing you could comment on quite a long time about the attitude of the Jews to the Gentiles but Paul says to Peter you and I are Jews buddy by birth we didn't get converted we're not proselytes we didn't come in from the heathen we're Jews by nature by birth and exactly the same word is used in Ephesians 2, 3. We are all by nature the children of wrath. By our very birth, we were born with a rebellious nature. 
And that's the root of our problems. It's the rebellious nature. Now, you say, well, God, does God punish me for my rebellious nature? No. God punishes you for your rebellious acts. But your rebellious acts are the result of yielding to your rebellious nature. See, God's perfectly just. Nobody's punished for their nature. People are all punished for their acts. The judgment of God in every scripture that deals with judgment is of works, not of nature. So we are responsible for letting that nature cause us to commit those acts. I just mentioned that by way of comment. But what we're dealing with now is this nature which is the root. And I would like to show you uh, further on in Ephesians what Paul says again. Now he uses the word old man. That is the nature. If Ephesians 4.22 Paul says we have to read from verse 20 to get the context. Ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him. Now some people haven't heard him. And particularly in this respect, there are many Christians that haven't heard him. And have been taught by him. I heard somebody say, once say, I've sat under teaching for two years and I'm not ready. But it's one thing to sit under teaching, it's another thing to be taught. See? Some people listen but never hear. And some people are taught but never learn. Because there's got to be an inner attitude before a person can hear and be taught. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation in relation to your former way of life, you put off the old man. The metaphor is from clothing. You take off one set of clothing and in verse 24 you'll see you put on another set to replace it. This is the exchange. The old set of clothing goes, the new set of clothing is put on. What is the old set of clothing? It's the old man. How is he described? He's corrupt according to the deceitful lust. The key word about the old man is the word corrupt. Uh, and it's the lusts of deceit. Because he was deceived, lust rose up in him and lust corrupted his nature. That's the that's the order of events and it refers back to the temptation where Adam and Eve were deceived, obeyed the devil's deception and lie and out of the devil's deception and lie through obeying it was brought forth in them lusts, perverted desires which corrupted their nature. That's the background of the old man. He's the product actually of the devil's lie believed and acted upon and the result is corruption. Now that's the nature that God has dealt with on the cross in Jesus Christ. Now I'd like you to turn to two passages in Matthew that also relate to this truth. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 10. These are words spoken by John the Baptist as the forerunner of Jesus and as the one who came to introduce the gospel. Matthew 3:10. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is the nature of the gospel dispensation. It's the most radical and in a sense the most ruthless of all God's dealings. God is not now chopping off branches. He's not even hewing down the trunk. The axe is laid to the very root, the very origin and source of the whole evil, corrupt life in the Adamic race is to be dealt with in the gospel dispensation. This is the message of the one who came to introduce it. And notice, every tree which doesn't bring forth good fruit is to be hewn down and cast into the fire. Some people will make their boast, well, brother, I don't do anything bad. That isn't going to get you by. What the question is, do you do anything good? The fruitless tree is going to be cut down just as much as the tree which brings forth bad fruit. The only tree which will be left standing is the tree that brings forth good fruit. And then in Matthew 7, 18, we have this statement about a corrupt tree. There are many different applications of it, but the principle applies all through. Matthew 7, 8, 18, not 8, 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Now, there are two impossibilities. One is that a good tree shall bring forth evil fruit. The other is that a corrupt tree shall bring forth good fruit. It cannot happen. And the old nature is a corrupt tree. Therefore, it cannot bring forth good fruit. It is no good trying to look for or expect good fruit from the old nature because it cannot happen. Therefore, what is God's remedy for the old nature? It's very simple. 
it's the axe at the root cut it down or put it in other language God doesn't improve the old man he doesn't reform the old man he doesn't make him religious he doesn't send him to church or Sunday school you know what he does he executes him the only remedy for the old man is execution now the message of God's grace is the execution has already taken place it happened when Jesus died on the cross our old man was executed hung up on the gibbet displayed in all his corruption abomination and put to death and every person that wants to live above sin has to grasp this fact and act on it you'll find the sixth chapter of Romans which is the one that presents this statement our old man was crucified with him goes on to say sin shall not have dominion over you but only when you grasp Romans chapter 6 verse 6 can you move on into the place where it is possible for you to live not under the dominion of sin now let's look a little more fully at the exchange that is to take place the old man was crucified that the new man might be brought forth let's look at a little at what the scripture says about the new man this is a tremendous study I don't want to go into it in great detail but Ephesians 4 24 the alternative we've dealt with Ephesians 4 22 putting off the old man Ephesians 4 24 that she put on the new man now the new man is described and I would like to read it this way who after God is created in righteousness and true holiness now more literally who in accordance with God's plan or God's standards or God's thinking or God's purpose whatever way you like to understand it because there's nothing pleasant in accordance with God was created in righteousness and holiness of truth in other words righteousness and holiness which are the product of the truth you see the old man was the product of the devil's lie he was the product of deception but the new man is the product of the truth of God's word concerning Jesus Christ the truth received by faith into our hearts brings forth a new man and that brings forth righteousness and holiness so the new man was created in accordance with God's standards purpose whatever you like to say in righteousness and holiness which are the product of the truth and then we turn to Colossians 3 and uh, we see there what Paul has to say about this exchange Colossians 3 10 uh, 3 9 deals with the old man lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds you notice the most distinctive single feature of the old man is the thing they're told not to do there it's what? lying because he's the product of deception his whole nature is deception and corruption he's the product of the serpent and I challenge anyone no one has ever seen a straight snake there isn't such a thing and the old man is just as crooked as the snake that brought him into being there is no truth in him he's crooked to the core uh, when he tries to be straight he's the most crooked lie not one to another seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds his deeds being primarily lying see the thing about lying is if you're going to commit any other sin sooner or later you'll have to join lying to it to cover up the other sin so if you keep from lying you will have to live right there's no alternative now then what about the new man Colossians 3.10 and have put on the new man now the King James says which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him I'll give it a little more literally which is being renewed you see Ephesians 4.22 says he was created that's God's side but our appropriation is progressive which is being renewed into the acknowledging of the creator to reproduce the creator's image I don't know whether I can say that again because it just slipped out but I'll try and say it the, the new man is being renewed into the knowledge or acknowledging of the creator so that the creator's image is restored in him see it's undoing the work of the fall because before the fall Adam had the creator's image perfect in him 
This is the nature of the new man. Now this new man, summed up in three words, is this. Christ in you. Uh, turning to Colossians 1, reading from verse 25 through 27, Paul is talking about the gospel. He says, Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill or to fully preach the word of God. Colossians 1, 25. Now then he speaks about the nature of this word that he has to present, even the mystery or secret which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to God's saints. The gospel contains God's secret which all previous ages and generations were not permitted to know but which is now revealed to you and me. This is the climax of all God's dealings and it's a secret that he kept hidden until the gospel. Now what is the secret? It's stated in verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this secret among the Gentiles. What is it? Very simple. Christ in you. That's the climax. That's the secret. That God was going to bring forth a race of people who would have Christ in them. The, and the new man, therefore, is Christ reproduced in you and me from the seed of the Word of God. Let's look at a little more fully at this. Galatians 2.20 Galatians 2.20 Paul deals with this truth in relation to his own personal testimony experience. I am crucified with Christ. Uh, you notice there are three phases to this business of being crucified. There's what God did, our old man was crucified. There's what we do, Galatians 5.24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and there's our confession. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Believe with the heart confess with the mouth. I remember years back how I had to struggle to come to the place where I had enough courage to say I am crucified with Christ. I thought what will happen? All hell will break loose. All my worst habits will immediately reassert themselves. And sure enough they did. But then I learned to hold on to my confession. I am crucified with Christ. If you take a new step forward in God and all hell breaks loose, praise the Lord for it. It's a sure sign you're getting somewhere. See? Because the devil doesn't bother to oppose you if you're going down a side alley. But if you're moving forward in God, then he'll turn loose all his artillery against you. See. And when the shells are bursting all around you, just say, praise the Lord. Like the story about the editor of the small town newspaper that started a very personal, personal column. He was sitting in his office one day with a man whom he was interviewing. And a great big brick came crashing through the window. And the editor said, I knew that personal column of ours was going to be a success. <laughs> so when the devil's brick comes through the window don't get disturbed see it just means you've hit him where it hurts and one thing we have to do in relation to every provision of Christ on the cross is make the right confession I'm cleansed by his blood I'm healed by his stripes I am crucified with him it's not I who live now well then who lives let's read on I'm crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me. This is the exchange. The old man died. The new man is Christ in you. Christ living in me. The life which I now live in the flesh. Notice this is not for eternity. This is for here and now. The life which I am now living in my family, in my home, with all my problems, with all my opposition, with all the misunderstanding and temptations and trials that befall me. I am living not by my own faith, but by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice again the substitutionary act. He died in my place. My old man was crucified in him that he as the new man might live in me. 